All right, hi everybody, this is Craig Shacklett from UR Comp. It is my honor and pleasure to have Steve Haltum from Axis Power Crafts. This is gonna be a special treat for us today. Steve, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for letting me come on, I appreciate it. Yeah, so Thanks Steve, tell us a little bit about, about Axis Power Crafts and, and what you do. Well, uh, of course a lot of the guys out there know me as Heavy, that's my nickname on the internet. And my casino handle, most of the guys that I hang out with have some sort of casino handle because they try to play under the radar. They don't want the casino to really know that this guy that's on, uh, on the internet right now or, or whatever is the same guy that's standing at the table in front of them because uh, I do teach an advantage play uh, method for casino crafts, dice control casino crafts. Uh, been doing that for God, about 20 years now. Uh, I uh, am called heavy because uh, when I started out this gig, I was about 100 pounds heavier than I am now. And I still shop at the big and tall man shop, so I guess I'll, I'll be heavy for as long as I live. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I've been playing the game for about 50 years now, you know. Uh, I've suddenly gotten old, and it's hard to believe that 50 years at the dice table, but it's absolutely the truth. Tell me about 50 years ago. How do you stumble upon craps what was was it love at first sight and how did you get into it i've always uh, had that little gambler's bone you know i always wanted to to make a buck the easy way if i could and uh, <laughs> i grew up in the country as a kid uh, you know we showed uh livestock in the 4-h shows the county fair and all that and i worked in the local county auction barn where they sold livestock and and uh there was always a game going somewhere in, in a in a barn somewhere. There'd be a card game or a dice game. So I got into it when I was really in my uh, my mid-teens. Yeah, I got uh, got started playing there when I uh, was uh, a, a little older. I guess uh, I got drafted, like a lot of guys, in the uh, 60s. Spent a couple of years working for Uncle Sam. And we'd have barracks games going on all the time. You know, we'd spread a blanket out on the floor and we'd roll the dice down the blanket, bounce them against the baseboard of the wall. And uh, one guy would be fading somebody else's bet. So it, it was a lot of fun. And, and the only guy that really made any money at it was the guy that was running the game, you know. But uh, it was a great way to learn some interesting techniques back then. The, uh, there's a technique called a blanket roll, specifically designed for uh, keeping the dice on axis when you throw them uh, and giving you an advantage over over the, the game if you know how to do it. And uh, really, that was one of my first introductions to any kind of dice control beyond, say, play a Monopoly when you were a kid. Yeah, <laughs> now, can I can we pause right there? Because I didn't, you know, we've talked a, a few times, you've exchanged a lot of emails before this, but I never, we never touched on the, the uh, military dice game going on. So is a game like that, is it I mean, is it like prison where you're betting cigarettes or you guys got some, some money or? It's betting dollars, two dollars, five dollars, ten, you know. Uh, nobody ever had a lot of money in, in the Army, you know. I mean, we were, we were working basically for $99 a month in your meals. So it uh, wasn't a lot of money to, to spare to gamble with. But, yeah, we all had some dollars. You know, we played dollar bill for this, two dollars for that. Was that something you had? Was that something you had to hide from the commanding officer? Oh, yeah, or? yeah. No, this was, yeah, this was completely under the radar. Uh, but, yeah, we'd, uh, we'd have one guy would uh, throw the dice and set a point, and then people would bet, you know, I, I think he'll make it, you know, or I want to bet a dollar on the six. Everything was even money. Nobody uh, had any odds or anything. It was all even money. And one guy's fading the bet. The other guy's taking, taking the odds. And uh, it was just a good, fun game, you know. Uh, nobody got rich at it. Nobody lost a lot of money. So uh, it was a good educational experience. Uh, when I got out of the military, I guess my first experience on a live table was at a casino party night at a church social. Uh, it was a fundraiser for church. I was working at a radio station at the time, and, and it was uh, my time to go out and be the uh, celebrity host of an event. So I got dubbed to go out and post this deal. And uh, I can tell you, I won, uh, I think it was $160 in coupons. I could exchange to buy something in an auction later on that night. And I bought a pocket knife with my points. And uh, 
I carried that knife for probably 30 years before I lost it. It's gone now. It's a great knife. And uh, I sure wish I still had the darn thing. <laughs> That's the way that goes. Uh, after that, I got out of the Army, moved on, uh, had some uh, some success in life and uh, uh, career field, and became something of a, a regular junket player over in Las Vegas. Uh, but the first trip to Las Vegas my wife and I took was a, uh, a corporate trip for the company I worked for. And uh, we had booked to stay on an extra three days after that trip was over with. So we had a full week in Vegas. And we were playing slots at a little place on the strip there uh, that's no longer in business, but uh, playing nickel slots. And my wife hit a jackpot for $200 with a nickel slot machine. I had to come out and hand pay her. And five, ten minutes later, it popped for another $200. She came out and hand paid her. Five or ten minutes later, it popped for another two hundred dollars. They came out with a cart, picked the machine up, and took it off the floor. Paid her, <laughs> put another machine in its place. Uh, when they did that, I had uh, I don't know, I think about thirteen, fourteen dollars in nickels. And I told my wife, I'm going to go over that dice table over there and check it out. And I took my nickels to the cage, cashed them in, and got dollar bills, and went over and bought in for I think a total of fifteen dollars at this dice. Table. It was a $1 game, and uh, my wife came looking for me about 45 minutes later, and she says, how much money do you have on the table out there? And I'm like, oh, it's like $30, $40, you know. How much you got in the rack? Oh, about another 130 And she said, I'll delete the expletives. Take that down right now. <laughs> Let's get the heck out of here. So that sounded like a good idea. So I turned my bets off. And uh, seven showed, and I got everything back except my pass line bet and odds, and and I, I cashed out $163 somewhere. Anyway, uh, that was my first in casino craps experience, and I, was, you know, the dealer was helping me bet. He was suggesting this and that. And I just went along with what he said most of the time. And like a lot of players just starting out, I was putting those dollars out in the field because that looked like a good deal to me, you know. Uh, so you do all that, you make those kind of mistakes when you're young and you luck into something and you have that big hit early on where you win 10 times what you bought in for and suddenly, hey, this is great, I could do this for a living, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then reality soaks in. Uh, but I became a junket player. I was going to Vegas or Reno, Tahoe four times a year. Basically. About once a quarter I'd roll out there. And if I got hit for a little and lost a little money during that time, it was no big deal because, uh, you know, it was only once a quarter. And it was entertainment money. And I was being entertained. So I, I looked at it as, as hey, I'd, I'd pay this amount of money over three months to go to a movie, go out to dinner, go to a show with a wife, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I guess this stuff changed when you think about it on, on that kind of basis. Then in 1994, something... Uh, kind of magical happened. They started opening riverboat casinos all over the Midwest and the South, and uh, they opened one 83 miles from my front door. And I went from being a once-a-quarter player to being a uh, once-a-week player. And we thought four nights a week I'd be over there sometime. Uh, at my peak, I was playing 300 sessions a year because I tracked all this stuff in Excel. Uh, I was playing 300 ses sessions a year and in, 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 took my wife over there one time for uh, an anniversary dinner and we walked in the casino and every table we walked past as we walked in, the dealer said, hey Steve, how you doing? <laughs> hey Steve, how you doing? <laughs> hey Steve, how you doing? My wife looks at me and says, buddy, you're spending way too much time over here. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> in the place knows you. But, uh, yeah, I, I I got to know the dealers really well, the pit people really well, and the hosts really well, and and I did things to enhance my experience at the casino. Like uh, occasionally, I'd send uh, uh, flowers to the host's uh, office, you know, a box of candy, or I'd send a box of candy to the dealer break room on the holiday, you know, something like that. So, and hey, this is from Steve Halton, you know, and. You go to the table and buy in, and the dealers, oh, Steve, 
man, thanks for sending that box of candy the other day. That was great. And you, you cultivate those relationships. And and it's beneficial to you down the line to do that because the, the uh, you, you'll find yourself in situations from time to time where maybe you normally bet a specific bet and you forgot to get it down. And a decision is made where that bet won. And you say, oh, my gosh, I forgot to get that bet down. And the need to say, say, just a minute, let me get that for you. And he'll turn to the box man and say, Steve, forgot that. He bets it every time. Let's go ahead and pay. And they set it up and go ahead and pay you, even though I didn't have to bet out. Well, that's a, that's a great point. I'll interject really quick because we do give tips to our players about maximizing comps. And it's always great to have the pit boss and the dealers on your side in that respect as well for when they're rating you, you want your average bet to look as high as possible. And so uh, you make a great point if you're playing at a place regular enough where they're, they'll get to know you on a uh, first name basis, giving a gift in the dealer room is something I never thought about before, but it makes total sense for, for what you're talking about. So thank you for that tip. And um, so I think you're kind of alluding to it. I mean, going from a once a quarter player to a once a week to scaring your wife with the entire casino knowing you, I imagine just time at table uh, helped you develop skills, but was there anything else that uh, in that time, in that development, that really was, you know, helped you develop your skill set? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I was losing my ass, which is just, <laughs> because, you know, that, that small loss I was having once a quarter became once a weekend and, and it compounded and compounded and compounded. And I'm like, yeah, I, I've got to learn to play smarter. So. I noticed over over my period of time there that, that there were some players in the casino who were consistently better shooters at the craps table than others. Every time they get the dice, they would have a longer than average hand, an average hand craps eight point three rolls, okay? From come out to seven out. That's one uh, eight point three rolls. So these guys would get the dice and they'd have a a 12, 14, 16 number hand, you know, maybe double what you should have on average. And so I just started doing what they did. They they all did pretty much the same thing. They pre-set the dice to a certain arrangement. And then these guys were all stackers. They'd stack one die on top of the other, and they would throw it into the hook or into the turn, you know, the curved part of the table. And they got fewer sevens than they should, and they would get more of one or two numbers than statistically you should see uh like the, they might for instance get more nines and you see these guys they set the dice like this and they throw a hop bet out hop the nine for twenty dollars okay they set the dice throw it down there and throw a nine and i'm like wow this is pretty cool i don't know why it's working but i want to try it so basically i just started doing what these guys did i set the dice like they did i threw them into the corner and pretty soon i was one of the best Shooters I knew, you know, I mean, I was having great hands. Uh, I didn't understand the math behind it or any of the statistics or anything until I was on a cruise on Royal Caribbean back in uh, 1998. And I was the only person at the dice table, the uh, stick lady, very attractive British woman. And I started throwing three craps and I threw three craps six times in a row. Now, if you were going to do that to own the casino, right? right? But I I was sitting there throwing three craps, three craps, three craps, six in a row, and finally she says, if you're not betting the three craps, you're not winning. And yeah, right, okay, three craps. Yeah, so I throw a three down and I throw 11 next, you know. <laughs> as soon as you bet it, it goes away. The streak's over. But uh, uh, that was uh, kind of a wake-up call for me. I, and that's really where the concept of, of signature numbers or dominant numbers based on how you set the dice and how you throw the dice uh, that you'll develop if you practice a lot. So I discovered an online community of, of folks who were into this whole dice setting thing and pre resetting the dice and throwing them a specific way to a specific point on the table in order to get repeating numbers. And uh, I did pretty much what they did. I built a little practice rig, basically a, a box with felt on the bottom of it, open on one end, 
and I bought uh, from Gambler's General Store some diamond pyramid to put on the back of it. And I built two of these boxes. One of them I just put the felt on bare, uh, bare plywood, and the other one I put an underlay under the felt to make it a little bouncy so I could emulate the conditions that the types of casino tables were going to cross. Across bouncy tables, run across hard tables. So I wanted to practice on both. Uh, started practicing on, on those tables regularly and experimenting with different dice preset arrangements. Okay. And there are there are six families of preset arrangements. There's hundreds of ways you can set the dice, but uh, there are six basic families. Each family has certain numbers that you should throw in greater proportion than statistically you would if you the random. So you look at that, and you, you want to try and, and focus on the dice where you throw those numbers, but you will get dice that a dice that'll bounce funny. You know, one die will stay on axis, as we call it. The other one may bounce off and go off axis. Uh, and so you'll see numbers develop that maybe are not in that that list, that matrix of numbers that you should roll. You'll see these numbers roll, and suddenly you're just pounding the crap out of the ten, and you shouldn't be rolling the ten. Well. That's because you've got some kind of a flaw in your grip or whatever. Hey, you have two choices at that point. You can try to fix the flaw or you can bet the damn 10. You know, right. in my case, I'm on that 10. You know, I see two 10s or two 4s or a 4 and a 10 row in a hand within four rows of each other. I'm going to be on both of them. Okay. But I'll get into that another time. Yeah. So, okay. So we, uh, so the eye-opening moment for you is the Royal Caribbean with the uh, the hot British craps dealer who was <laughs> admonishing you for not betting the three craps when you kept rolling it, and then you discovered an online community. And is that online community still around? Uh, that original one is long gone. There've been several of them that have come and gone through the years, uh, and I'll just tell you why. The uh, craps forums that you see online, uh, most of them are unmoderated. They will let anybody register. They uh, don't care what you post, what you say about someone. So you have a, a in any online forum community, you have what we call the flamers, the guys that no matter what you say, they're going to argue with you and trash talk you. Uh, you have the spammers that come in that are trying to sell their uh, uh, betting strategies or, or uh, herbal Viagra or uh, porn or whatever they're trying to hawk. It's like walking down the street in Vegas with the with the porn slappers out there slapping their brochures. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, that's the way the internet is. So uh, there have been a lot of them come and go, uh, often for uh, litigation reasons they've gone away because they allow this stuff to happen, you know. Uh, so back about, uh, oh, 15, 16 years ago, I, I cranked up my own forum on the internet uh, called Access Power Craps. And... Uh, we decided we were going to heavily moderate it and we were going to try to track who we had on the forum so we knew that people registering were legitimate people. Uh, you'll get guys that want to stir up all things on the internet that'll, that'll register on a forum like that under a dozen different names. Okay? And they'll go in and post, boy, I sure wish this would happen. And they'll log out, and they'll log in under the next name. Yeah, I do too. You know, and they'll log out, and log in under other. Boy, this guy's a dumbass. You know, and they just—it's—it yeah. appears to the casual reader that you've got a dozen different people dogpiling on player A over here, because for some reason or another they don't like the guy, uh, but or he's just the victim of the week, whatever. Uh, and I wanted to eliminate that. So, uh, on on my forum we do. Uh, uh, vet people pretty good before we, we get them online. Uh, I check IP addresses to make sure it's a valid IP address. Uh, I have a, a software service that goes through and filters out anybody that's a spammer or a flamer, has a known history of causing problems on forums. And we charge a whopping $12 membership activation fee to separate real people from uh, the people who are not, because if you're going to pay your 12 bucks through PayPal for a membership in this in this forum, uh, you've got to have a PayPal account and a valid email address. So that uh, 
that's the sole reason for the 12 bucks. I don't need anybody's 12 bucks. In fact, often I give it back to them. A lot of times I'll tell people, uh, hey, shoot me an email and tell me uh, we talk, you know, and, and I'll comp you in on the form. In fact, I'll, I will do that for your listeners if they are interested in that form. Uh, if they'll shoot me an email and tell me who they are and that they saw this video, they like to be a member of the forum, uh, I'll send them back instructions on how to get registered to a comp in form. Oh, well, that's awesome. So let's give a quick plug because a $12 savings, I could buy quite a bit of herbal Viagra, which you will not see advertised on your forum. But all right, so uh, it's, is it Axis Power Craps? Yes, that's all one word. A-X-I-S-P-O-W-E-R-C-R-A-P-S dot com. And to get to the forum, you put that address in and then you put a forward slash uh, and one word Craps Forum after it. If you go to the accesspowercraps.com website, uh, you'll find a whole 50 or 60 of my articles on craps there that you can read for free. And there's a link there that'll get you over to the craps forum. Awesome. All right. And so tell tell Heavy that you you heard him on the UR Comp podcast or on a UR Comp video, and he'll hook you up. So thank you for that generous offer. That is awesome. So you got in these forums. Obviously, now you developed your own, and you started swapping ideas and came up with uh, dice stacking, a few other ideas, and you tested them out on your uh, on the crafts tables that you built at your house. And how, how long did it take you training before you really started seeing results in the real world? Uh, really about six months. Uh, but I practiced every day for 30 minutes to, you know, hours a day. Uh, I had my uh, practice rig set up right next to the door to my office. So whenever I walked into the office, I would stop and throw the dice until I seven down. Okay, so I'd throw one hand. Then I'd go to my desk, sit down, do whatever I had to do. If I had to get up and go to the kitchen to get a bottle of water, I stopped on my way out the door and threw a hand. When I came back in the door, I stopped and threw a hand. Every time I walked through the door to my office, I would throw a hand at a crap. So it's, it's just a trick, a tool, whatever, a gimmick to get yourself to practice on a regular basis. And you don't have to stand there for two hours to do it. You know, you just throw one hand. It might be uh, six rolls. It might be 60 rolls. But uh, you throw one, then you go on. And, of course, in those days, we tracked everything by hand manually. And I had a little charts. I tracked my rolls in. I tracked what we call sevens to rolls ratio. So uh, if you threw... 36 times and you rolled two, then you have a seven roll ratio of 18. That's ridiculously unheard of. But in a in a short series of, of numbers like that, a short selection, it's, it's entirely possible to have uh, no 36 rolls and no sevens, you know. So uh, rolls ratio, no, I don't ever throw a seven. <laughs> but, but of course, everyone does. Uh, but uh, I track that, you track the dominant numbers. Uh, Track box numbers per, you know, how many paying numbers I roll for set for every seven that's thrown. So that's another angle on on doing it. Uh, a lot of options, uh, but uh, that was uh, that was the main force of it. Uh, but it took about six months to get get up to, up to skill. And would you say for this is a two part question for somebody out there that likes pay, playing craps? I know we're going to get into some tips in a minute, but for somebody that likes playing craps, wants to develop their skills and practice at home, would you say that the best investment they can make is a uh, a table? I mean, like something like something to practice on. Is that an absolute necessity, or what's kind of the a good entry level way to start uh, practicing? I wrote an article years ago called the sock drawer practice rig. You know, and it was basically take a sock drawer out of the dresser. Put a towel in the back of it and a piece of foam rubber on the back. Set it on your kitchen table and back up. Set the ironing board up and toss the dice from the ironing board into the sock drawer and use that to practice with. I mean, something as simple as that will work. One of the best shooters I know, a guy up in Chicago, uh, his practice rig is made out of a cardboard box. It's open on one end. Uh, This guy plays the casino probably four or five times a week. He's a very good player. the uh, the first thing I recommend people do is read everything they can get on the site, okay? And 
although I do seminars and I train people on, on dice control and betting strategies, and I also do blackjack and baccarat, roulette, but primarily craps is my game. Uh, the thing to remember is there's a wealth of information on the internet for free. Okay, so you should read everything you can get for free. The other thing you need to remember is 80% of what you read for free is BS, okay? So you got to take it with a grain of salt. But you will see in reading stuff by different authors, you will find that they're repeating concepts that you see over and over and over again. So those are valid concepts most of the time to look into. Uh, there's a, a company uh, that teaches dice control, similar to what I do. He uses a slightly different technique than I do. Uh, I disagree very strongly with the way they teach people to throw the dice, but I won't go into any details of it here. That's something we can talk about offline. When we're at the table, I can actually demonstrate. Uh, we try to uh, teach a strategy that minimizes the, the out roll out of the dice. We want to keep them on axis, hence the name of the axis power craps. But I, I wandered the field here a little bit. Uh, the the key no, starting is learn everything you can for free, then buy a book. And there are several good books on dice control for casino craps, but the only one I recommend was written by a friend of mine who goes by the, the handle Mad Professor, and it's Mad Professor's Crap Shooter's Bible. Uh, Mad Professor was a forum member on my forum and uh, another forum, the old dicesetter.com website. And then he started his own forum a few years ago, and he's kind of disappeared off the off the grid uh, the last couple of years. But uh, he wrote a great book. It was published by Stanford Long at Pie Press, and, and uh, it's got a lot of great content. And uh, I agree with pretty much everything the guy said. So. Uh, down that line, that's a, that's a good book for you, and you can probably get it used on on Amazon. No, that's that's perfect. And so the I know we're we're coming up against it pretty soon. Now, I know you teach not only power axis uh, the the dice control strategy, you also te bet teach uh, bankroll strategy and betting strategies. So. Why don't you give us, is there any kind of good beginner tips that maybe somebody, just to kind of whet someone's appetite where they can then dive into your website and your forum to... Interesting, you use the word dive right there because uh, uh, one of the key principles that I teach at Craft is uh, summed up in a single line. It's don't test the depth of the water with both feet. If you were in Atlantic City in the heyday back in the 70s, when they were really rocking, a Port Authority bus would pull up to the casino, people would spew out, they would literally run to the dice table and throw all their money on the table, and 30 minutes later, they're back at the bus stop waiting to catch a ride back to the city because they've blown through the entire bank road in 30 minutes. You don't have any concept of what's going on at the table. You don't really have a, a solid betting strategy in mind, something that'll give you some advantage, or at least give you some breathing room. Craps is a game that's, that's very volatile. Okay, Most of the time it's choppy, meaning you win one, you lose one. You win one, you lose two. You win two, you lose one. You know, So you stay pretty close to even for a long time. Then you'll either go through a very hot streak where good things happen, or you'll get a very cold streak where bad things happen. So you want to minimize your bets when bad things are happening. I teach a regression strategy on that. Let's just say, and you can add as many zeros to this as you want to to make it comfortable for you. If you're a high level player, add two zeros, you know? But let's just say we're betting a $30 six and eight, okay? Could be a 300, could be a 3,000. Uh, $30 six and eight, shooter tosses the dice, you get a hit on the eight, it pays you $21. Now you tell the dealer, make the tie stump, or it pays you $35. It pays you $35, you tell the dealer to make my six and eight look like 18 each. He'll say, drop me a dollar. You drop a dollar, he'll take the 35 that you set out there for you to pay plus that dollar, and he'll hand you 60 change, and he'll set the $18, six and eight. 
you now have one dollar at risk okay to the seven but you've got 36 dollars in action the next hit is going to pay that 21 dollars out this morning. so at 18 dollars you get the second hit at page 21 dollars you now have a 20 dollar profit lockup and all it took was two hits on the six rate uh that's the most dominant number the six and eight combined you've got 10 ways to roll the six and eight you got six ways to roll seven so you're in a very strong position after that regression once you get that six and eight paid for and twenty dollar profit to track then for me the sky is the limit okay uh, next hit i'll just run through the quick progression for you the next hit on either one i'm going to drop three dollars and tell them to go to forty two dollars on that I've still got $17 profit locked up. 42, if it hits again, it's going to pay 50 for one. It pays $49. I drop a dollar, get 50 change. I now have $66 profit. If it rolls again, pays that 50 for one, I'm going to tell him press the 90, and then I get a dollar change. It goes to 90, and if it rolls again, it pays 105. At 105, I take the black chip. I toss the five dollars in and say for the dealers they, they lock up a five dollar token they're happy to see me get to a ninety dollar six or eight they know you're getting five bucks when that happens they're even happier when i get to a nine hundred dollar six or eight. It, it pays a thousand fifty and i'll throw the fifty to them and you'll be amazed at how often with this progression it's really pretty simple it's it's uh once you do your regression, it's 18, 42, 90. Then we go 180. We just add a zero to that 18. Press to 180. Then we go to 420. And you go to 900. That's six hits. And you're at $900. Seven hits is going to pay you 1000 Lock up $1,000. On the eighth hit, you're at, you're at 90. So you go to 1800. You go from 1800 to 4200 to table max. So now you're at two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, basically ten hits, and you're at table max on the six and eight, starting with an eighteen dollar six and eight. And I get I get mine to to uh, eighteen hundred all the time. Uh, a stretch to forty two hundred, a little more rare. Uh, table max, ah, good luck. You know, I mean, they yeah. move the table max in Vegas on on most of the tables I play on to ten grand. So. Uh, I, I haven't been there yet. I have hit uh, table max on the four and ten a few times, but, uh, and that's even sweeter. <laughs> wow! No, I love we'll that progression. That, we'll save that for another time. I'm getting an itch. I, I want to head to the craps table with you right now. Actually, it makes it sound so simple. I'm I'm ready to try this progression out, or regression progression. But the thing is, by regressing your bets early, you you chop off that that big loss. Okay down there at the bottom where you would keep betting and chasing it but you leave yourself open to win big if anything happens you know in a hand break. so uh that's what we're trying to do we're trying to break loose with the big hand and and uh catch a streak like that uh i'll give you an example because i love war stories I, I had some students come in from south america i won't say what country uh because these guys were uh <clears throat> in in the country illegally uh, they were, uh, uh, what do you call them? Vinny, uh, Joey, and Uncle Carmine. <laughs> so, uh, they came in to do a class with me, and they are very high limit players. Uh, and, uh, Vinny's standing next to me at the table, and he's betting 9,600 across, okay? Uh, so that's, uh, 1500, 1500, 1500, 1500, 1800, 1800 90, 9600 across. Uh, the gal that throws the dice throws a nine and he gets paid $2,100. And I say, okay, Benny, look, regress your bets to uh, 3600 across. And now, now you've got, you know, only about $1,000 at risk. You've got this money off the table. And he says, screw it, I came to play. Well, next loss was seven, and he lost nine thousand six hundred dollars. So the net loss was seven thousand dollars instead of two thousand. So, uh, and I said, "Well, screw it. You played. How'd it feel?" You know, I. <laughs> I 
you're paying me to, to tell you how to play and you're not paying attention. Uh, but you see that quite often. People are creatures of habit when they get to the table. They're used to betting a specific strategy. Uh, they get the blinders on and don't get outside of the box and, and they actually tune out what's what's going on. There's a popular author out there that says never bet five and five uh, because it has a 4% house edge on it. Uh, in Mississippi, where the five and nine are bought for $20 and you pay the big on that after the decision, uh, that gets the uh, house edge down to 1.96%. So that's a very strong bet in Mississippi where you can buy it and pay the big after you get it. Uh, I, I routinely get my five and nine up starting with, with $15 each on them up to 750 bucks on my hand. Not, not difficult to do. Uh, so there, there are strategies out there that we teach that are outside the box and we try to get you to, to get the blinders off and be aware of what's going on at the table as far as what numbers of these shooters have. You'll see a guy that's, uh, we won't call him a, a dice controller. We'll call him a, uh, a rhythm roller. Okay, he's got rhythm. Okay, he he gets the dice and he bounces them off the back wall a couple of times till he sees the number he wants. Then he picks them up and throws them sideways down the table into the hook. And he tosses them exactly the same way, exactly the same face the table every time, and he gets repeating numbers. And his toss looks from from, if you look at it compared to what I teach, which is a very controlled, restrictive type toss, uh, it looks very free and open and rhythmic, and he's casual. He's like a dancer out there. And yet he's throwing numbers and numbers and numbers. Well, you've got to learn to recognize, hey, this guy has thrown eight nines in his hands before, and all I'm betting is a six and eight. You know, uh, what is it? The dice doctor said, uh, you only back a winning horse. Well, if the nine is the winning horse, that's the guy you got to be betting on. So, uh, yeah, you, you kind of follow the dice and let them tell you. Well, that, that's a really good tip, too. So we've gotten a couple super strong ones so far. Uh, the one was the regression strategy that I'm sure anyone listening or watching this is going to rewind and probably watch that section about four times to make sure they got it down. But then also you're saying pay attention to a roller if somebody has a good rhythm, they look like they got a consistent throw, they may either knowingly or unknowingly um, have have a groove. Like they may consistently throw the same numbers, pay attention to it, and then make those bets that keep showing up because odds are good they may continue to show up and you can make money on it. Well, Heavy, heavy I think this is this has been awesome. I know we're planning on doing a couple more of these. I know you and I are working on uh, trying to figure out when we can do some kind of event together. We can invite a lot of people to, to meet you in person. So uh, I know on a hopefully not too distant future, we'll be able to do another interview and announce a, a date and a place for that. But for now, I think this has been amazing. So if anybody wants to learn more, go to axispowercraps.com. You got a craps forum there. It's normally $12 uh, to get in, but Heavy made a super generous offer to anybody, any UR Comp fans out there to uh, drop him a note, say you're coming from UR Comp, and he will comp your admission. And uh, Heavy, I, I can't thank you enough, sir. Anything else, any parting thoughts before we uh, wrap up for now? I think we're good. I think I covered everything that uh, we had on the list today, so uh, and probably a little more. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is awesome. You probably figured out by now I like to talk. I, well, I like to listen. This has been awesome. So thank you, Heavy. And I got one more question, actually. Did you ever, with the with the tables that you built to practice on, do you ever make your wife come out and talk in a British accent to you? And, uh, oh, tell you about uh, the crafts? But, uh, but both of my daughters learned to deal dice when they were uh, single digits, like eight, nine years old. Uh, so either one of my daughters, when they turned 18, could have gone to New Mexico and, and auditioned in uh, one of the Indian casinos over there and got a job dealing craps. They, <laughs> they show up to training and they're like, no, no, that won't be necessary. We've got this. Our dad taught us. I'll tell you one parting story here. I had uh, uh, the wife and the daughter in the car, and she was about four years old. And I always keep a pair of dice in the little coin cup in the in the between the seats there in the car 
And when I'm in traffic, I'll just fiddle with them and throw them, fiddle with them and throw them. And, 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 uh, I came out of the, the store I'd got into, and my wife and the four-year-old daughter are having an argument about uh, the dice game they're playing. <laughs> my wife says, my, as I open the door, I hear my daughter say, no, Mom, you threw seven. You lose. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is, uh, here's what happened. You know, I threw the dice, and the nine was my point, and I, uh, you know, then I did this, that, and then I threw a seven. I said, you lost. And she just, oh, you're going to pay for this someday. <laughs> I, had a jukebox, I had a juice box on the hard eight. Come on. I, yeah, I need to start training my four-year-old Lucas then. I need to. All right. I'll, yeah, when you launch the uh, your preschool course, let me know. I'll, I'll enroll him. <laughs> hey, Heavy, thank you again, sir. It was a pleasure. Look forward to having you on again soon. Yeah, we'll do it. Have a good one. Uh, all right, you too.